We're going to turn and start in the book of Daniel. And we're going to study a familiar story. And I want us to collectively go back and look at what happened in this story. The book of Daniel is a prophetic book, but it begins with the story of the life of Daniel and of the three Hebrew boys. In the book are given secrets to surviving in a time when you are displaced, of ways to be strong and to be powerful when the world is against you. The Babylonian Empire had risen, had conquered or supplanted the Assyrian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar had come to power, and Nebuchadnezzar was an interesting character. He was really Nebuchadnezzar II, but he reigned over a kingdom that had changed the way the world would forever function. Babylon was instrumental in creating the financial systems that to this day we still participate in. Babylon was instrumental in setting up uh, hybrid religious systems and, and pagan systems, superstitions, and even the zodiac signs uh, 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 that we look at to this day had their had hands touched by Babylon. Babylon was a mighty empire, a sophisticated empire, so sophisticated that their leadership understood that if they took over a land, it was easier to control the land if you control their princes. And so rather than stationing troops, what they did is they actually made the leadership or the sons of the leadership to basically be Babylonian. Nebuchadnezzar was upset because Neb uh, Babylon at this point had fallen from the greatness it once had. And one of the things he was looking to do was to make Babylon great again. So he came to power with that mindset that he would transform Babylon, that it would be a powerhouse again. And, and he came in and began to conquer lands and to stop the negotiations the way that they were. He, he moved to change things. And one of the nations that he wanted was the nation of Judah. Israel, the northern kingdom, had already fallen to the Assyrians. Thank you. And he wanted this nation, and you remember the story of Hezekiah, how he showed the Babylonian emissaries all of the storehouse of, the, of, the, of, of God and, and what was in the treasury. And, and, and when they left, you could tell from the Bible story that one day they were going to come back. If you grew up poor in poor neighborhoods, you, you, one of the things your mother told you was that you make sure that no one knows what, what's of value in your house. And one day Nebuchadnezzar came back, and when he came back, he took the princes. Four of them were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he took them, and they were carried by, uh, by, by slave trade all the way back to the great city of Babylon. Babylon was designed like our, our capital of Washington, D.C. It was designed to get people to be impressed by its architecture and design. So when you got there, there were amazing structures and temples and palaces and, and you would have been in awe coming from almost anywhere else in the world. The style of building in Babylon was the most uh, uh, contemporary style in the world. He built the hanging gardens because his wife was a foreigner to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar did, and he built those hanging gardens to remind her of her homeland in the mountains. The captivity was serious, and the children of Israel, the children of Judah that went there, had to make great adjustments as they were being indoctrinated into the mindset of Babylon. Well, as you know, this great king Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and in Daniel 2, Daniel has to explain the dream to him, and he is caught up with the idea that Babylon, and him in particular, Nebuchadnezzar, represents the head of gold. And this triggers something in him. He never wants, he seems to never want to relinquish the idea that he is the most powerful ruler the world would ever know. So he comes up with an idea 
comes up with an idea to build his own statue and to have everyone bow and worship it. He seeks to unify his kingdom by creating a one religious system. And in this he starts in Daniel chapter 3 and in verse 1 it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dora in the province of Babylon. They have found in regions of the modern day Iraq pedestals where such a statue, such an idol would be able to fit. Archaeologists have found that. He goes and he builds this big thing, and verse 2 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When all of these dignitaries, verse 3, were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, they stood before the image that he had set up. And a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that when you hear the music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship the very same hour will be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now when I was preparing this, I've read the story many times, but I never thought about why was the instrument of persecution or of, 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 of death a kiln? Why, why would an oven be the, 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 the recognized method through which you would actually destroy your adversaries? Why put, I mean, you could put a, an arrow through their heart or, or chop them with a sword. Why the extravagance of a kiln? Well, because it carried also religious significance. Stone itself was rare in Babylon. The Babylon, Babylonians used brick rather extensively. The brick cured normally at about 1,000 degrees centigrade, but Babylon, a Babylonian kiln might have operated up to 1,300 degrees centigrade. The temperature normally required to, of, 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 to fire the sort of colored glazed bricks that Babylonian artisans used to quite striking effect, especially during Nebuchadnezzar's massive building program. The kiln was a way to recognize Nebuchadnezzar's greatness. Anyone who did not follow him was put into the kiln. And Burn, being burned in the kiln was significant that uh, you, whether willingly or unwillingly, were going to be following Nebuchadnezzar in a way that was divine. In fact, every brick they put out was stamped with Nebuchadnezzar's name on it. Here's an example from the Bible History Online website of a brick. So you can imagine that he would make these amazing bricks and there would be ceramic uh, uh, um, paint glazed on top with, with design. So when you looked up at the buildings, they had a glow to them almost. And, and there were amazing patterns on them. And underneath or on the back of every brick, it said, made by Nebuchadnezzar, made by Nebuchadnezzar, made by Nebuchadnezzar. The kiln itself fed his narcissistic ego. And so to punish you, he placed you in the place where he made the bricks that would build his legacy. This was Nebuchadnezzar's plan. But when the music was played, everyone that heard it was to fall down and worship this golden image. So he brings in music. And I, and I want you to get this. There were three things that he did to really take liberty. We had an amazing presentation during Sabbath school about religious liberty. But there are three things that Nebuchadnezzar looked to do. There are probably others, but three things that pop out. He wanted to stop the outcome of prophecy. And he wanted to stop the outcome of prophecy by uniting his kingdom under the banner of false worship. Secondly, Nebuchadnezzar mistook his civil a power for moral power. He confused the fact that he was in power 
with the idea that somehow he being in power made whatever he said morally right and justifiable. But thirdly, entertainment, the music that played, was used to help soften the minds of those who might be reluctant from the other kingdoms who served other gods to bow before this particular statue. I'd submit to you that you could look at these three patterns and see that as prophecy fulfills in this world, these three mechanisms may come to play right here in our own country. Now verse 8 says, Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. There were three that did not bow. When the music played, a whole uh, vast crowd of people dropped and, and, and began to worship. But, but as, the, as, the, as the Babylonian leadership looked out across the crowd, only three figures were still standing. And they went to snitch to Nebuchadnezzar. They said, O king, live forever. In verse 10, he says, Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship, he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now watch this. I like this line. It says, There are certain Jews. You could gloss over that and miss the significance of that statement. There are certain Jews, meaning that some of the Jews aren't like the other Jews. Oh, y'all missing this thing. Everybody we brought from Judah is not exactly the same. There's some folk who came from Judah who, who are not quick to bow to the idols of Babylon. And there are three, there are certain Jews that, that, that are not bowing. There's certain Jews. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O oh king, they've not regarded you. Look at the charges they're getting them. They have not regarded you. They do not serve your gods, which means this goes back before this particular instance. Nor do they worship the golden image which you have set up. They're different because, listen, they don't look at you ha, the way other men do. They do not fall to the cult of personality. They're not impressed with your speeches and, and your sophistication. They're not concerned with your poll numbers, King. Let me tell you something. I, you know, I've been amazed. This, and I'm, try, I'm trying to go quick, but let me, let me stop and say something here, man. I'm trying to go through this thing, but let, let me say this. See, I'm used to preaching at black churches. There, you know, the clock, they don't even have a clock on the wall, you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I, when this last election took place, and my good friend Mark is here, boy, people were heated. There was all the debate over this thing. We were at a house in L.A., and people were going at it over this thing. And, and you picked it right, Mark, I have to say. But let me tell you something. When the election came down, I started getting texts on my phone of folk telling me they were moving to Canada. And then I got that, I knew it was bad when folks started saying they was moving back to Jamaica. I love Jamaica, but I, they came to America for a reason. They were ready to go back. Folks started telling me they were leaving the country or they, or they were going to build a, a bunker and hide. Anxiety took people over and they were so afraid of who had been elected. Ah, but I had to write, remind them from Scripture. Daniel 2 and verse 21, the Bible tells me that God says through Daniel, I am he who sets up kings and I take them down. In fact, when Jesus is standing before Pilate and Pilate says, why aren't you speaking? Don't you know that I have power to give life or to take your life? Jesus paused, hold up. The Lord had not been saying much, but, but when that was said, Jesus stops him and says, Don't you realize you only have power because my Father gives you power? I saw people start panicking. I said, Wait a minute, did on November 9th or 8th or whatever the election, did God cease to be in control? Where's all this fear coming from? God is in control. 
And guess what? You may not always like which way the thing turns, but it doesn't change the fact that the God of the universe is in control. As long as he's in control, I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to be afraid. The first evidence I have that he has lost control, I'll get worried. But I know from biblical history and, 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 and the history of man that God stays in control. Verse 13. Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Now, I'm going to go through seven things. Seven, the seven P's to surviving persecution. Seven things you need. Some of this is from my own experience, but it's from the scripture, so I'll just, I'll just salt it with my stuff, all right? Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible says in verse 13, in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they brought these men before the king. The first thing you need to know is that pressure is going to come. That's the first P. You need to expect it. The Bible says that all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer persecution. We sometimes think that that persecution is from civil authority. Let me remind you that it is a spiritual warfare as well. That you may have persecution because of illness or, or because of financial situation or, or other things, but trouble is going to come to the believer. A lot of folk who think that when you become a Christian, all of a sudden, everything's going to go rosy and you're never going to have a problem, but, but that's not biblical. Blessed are ye, Matthew 5, 11 says, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I want you to understand that pressure is going to come. And if we look at it through the stream of time and in the sense of prophecy, we as a church must be prepared and understand that the day is going to come when we are going to have to deal with external pressure. Ha, an internal pressure. That in fact, if you stand for the principles of God, a time is going to come when you are going to have a target on your back. In fact, for some, the time has already arrived. The first one, pressure. It's coming. Expect it. Number two, 14, on the second uh, verse here, 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up. He can't believe it. Who would defy Nebuchadnezzar? So he has to stop. He wants to ask them the question. Is this true? And he gives them a second chance. If you be ready at the time when you hear the sound of the music, fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, he makes a threat. You'll be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And ha, ah, I like this part. He says, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? You got to get what Nebuchadnezzar is saying. At first, he does what the world does. The first, the world's going to give you a pass. The world is not like church folk. You know, we preach and we, we scare you, try and scare you into the, into the kingdom. Right? We want to tell you all the bad stuff that's going to happen. There's a reason the Bible is full of passages on heaven. Right? There's a reason there's both things in the Bible because God wants you to serve him out of love, not fear. So Nebuchadnezzar understands this. And he's, the first thing he says, look, I don't know, maybe you didn't hear the music. Maybe you're deaf a little bit. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I had something wrong to eat and didn't want to kneel down. I, I don't know. But I'll give you another chance. And if you, if you just kneel the second time, don't worry about it. I'll excuse. Remember, they'd already been recognized by Nebuchadnezzar as special. They had a brighter future. Oh, y'all missing this thing. They had a brighter future than the rest of the children from Judah. So he's trying to say, look, I handpicked you already. Just... Just, just bow the next time and we'll forget what happened, happened. Now, if you're crazy enough not to bow, he says, 
That same hour, meaning immediately, I'm going to throw you into a burning, fiery furnace. So, he, you know, it's good cop, bad cop. He gives you the, 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 the easy way out, promotion, everything's going to be fine. So he offers you something, that's what the devil does. If you're not willing to sell your soul for stuff, he figures you're a chicken and you'll sell yourself to save yourself. Oh, y'all missing this thing. So he, he tries both tactics. But then he asks the question to really mess with their brain. And if you don't understand the Old Testament and you don't get the great controversy, you don't get the power of this question. Because the question says, who is that God? Which is a derogatory statement about God. Who is that God who shall deliver you out of my hands? And here's why Nebuchadnezzar, don't miss this, has almost a right to that question. Because in the ancient world, the great controversy was played out as nations battled one another. You get that? And whichever nation won, it was assumed that their God was victorious over the God of the other nation. You get that? So the reason Nebuchadnezzar feels he has the right to ask this question of Jehovah God is because he's already beaten God's people. Are you getting this thing? So the reason he can ask this question is because in his treasury are the things from Jehovah's sanctuary and his temple. Are you getting it? The reason he can ask this question is because four of the royal line of this nation are now working for him. He can ask this question because he's already beaten Jehovah in his mind. And watch this. I would bet that there were many of the children of Israel who went into captivity with these four men, with Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, who agreed with that sentiment. And they bowed. Oh, you get that? You see, what happens is if you allow the devil to run his course, he gets into your head and he makes you think when God doesn't seem to show up right when you need him or how you need him, you begin to think that somehow God lost. And you can now justify turning your back on God. You didn't get through college. You claim the promises and now your life is a mess so you blame God. And so you drift away from church. You drift away from the things of God. Until eventually you're in front of the idol bowing. Your marriage didn't work out. Your, your child went astray. Uh, whatever happened, happened. And, and you stopped trusting God. And in your doubt, the enemy begins to plant the seeds of idolatry. Because all of a sudden, the world feels better than God does. And you bow. But three men understood in that whole crowd that you cannot base your religious experience on feeling. You can't even base it on what you see around you. Your, your experience with God must and always must be based on a relationship with him that does not change although the circumstances do. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were some bad boys. Bad meaning good. They, they, were some, they were some powerful young men. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, I like this. They said, we are not careful to answer you on this matter. I like that. They, <laughs> they make sure that Nebuchadnezzar knows up front that they have not budged in their position. In fact, the, 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 the statement that they do not regard him that was brought against them by the Chaldeans, they make sure to support that statement and say, listen, we're about to answer you, but we're not mincing our words. Not trying to be politically correct. We are going to say what we need to say, and, and you may not like it, Nebuchadnezzar. So the second P to survive in persecution is this one comes from our scripture reading, it is understanding God's power. And the power that he can impart on you as a Christian to stand in difficult times. 
2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a what? A sound mind. Not an anxious, fretful, nervous, afraid mind. I talk to Christians all the time that are so afraid. They're afraid of the mark of the beast. They're afraid of the, the vice president. They're afraid. You're afraid of everything. What are you so afraid of? Is not God in control? Daniel 3.17, if it be so, our God whom we serve is, ah, I like this, he's able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. The, 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 the key word there is the word able. He is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand. He's able, they said. But verse 18 is critical to your religious walk, your, your Christian walk, let me be clear. But, if not, you need to understand Nebuchadnezzar. That we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Power in that statement. Listen, listen. Our God is able. So our, our dealings with you, Nebuchadnezzar, our dealings in the modern time with the world is a dealing that says our God is able. That's where you start, church. You start there because that liberates you to stand firm in God. When you understand that he's able and no matter, nothing's going to change his ability, you can stand strong. Because then you understand that just as they say, if he chooses not to deliver you, it's not because he wasn't able to. Ah, it's because he saw fit not to. Which is a very different outcome. The third P is promise. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the fires, they shall not overflow. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. They understood that promise. And they stood in that promise. Let me tell you something. When, when you start to go through real trials, some of the stuff like I went through, one of the books of the Bible that's become like, and I say this every time I speak almost now, is, and we'll talk about it more this afternoon, is the book of Psalms. It's a book, when I was growing up, it was a book that I looked at as, ah, this is a book, a filler book. You know, when I was a kid, it was a filler book. You use it when you need a, special, when you need a scripture reading, but somebody forgot to give the scripture reading. Or you're going to have worship at the house and nobody really prepared anything. So you open up a psalm and you read a psalm. It was a filler book. Listen, you start going through something and start reading these same exact psalms. Let me tell you something. I'm a physician. I prescribe medicine. There isn't a medicine on the planet as potent as the psalms to a suffering soul. You can treat anxiety with a prescription in the psalms. Powerful stuff. You've got to know the Bible promises. You've got to know the prophecy, but you've got to know the promises. If all you know are the prophecies, you might wind up afraid of your future. But you need to know the prophecy and the promises. Because when you understand them both, you understand the waters are going to get rough, that times are going to get hard, but you can stand on the promise that God is going to see you through it all. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar heard these guys talking like this, he got really upset. The scripture says Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. He got real angry. And the form of his visage, his, his face changed and, and was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He changed the way he looked. And he spoke and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times hotter than it was supposed to be heated. And he commanded his most mighty men that were in his army to bind these three men and cast them into this burning fiery furnace. And he said, make sure you put them in with their coats on and their hosen and their hats, all of their garments, and, and, and they're to be cast in bound. That's a cruel thing to do. Because if you throw somebody in fire full of clothes, they're going to catch fire faster, and the clothes is going to burn them different than the fire. Are you getting that thing? So they're going to have two different levels of temperature burning them all over at the same time. It 
it was to make a point and he bound them so that they couldn't move why so that they couldn't even find a cooler spot in the furnace but because of the king's commandment was urgent the fire the furnace was exceeding hot the flames of the fire killed the men that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the men who picked them up, these mighty men, died of the heat before they got fully into the furnace. And all th these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fell down, bound, into the midst of the fiery furnace. The story is supposed to end there. If there was no God, that would be the end of the story, and we would never have heard it. For all the people that say the Bible doesn't exist, they, this, these stories mess them up. They, they have to try and find a way to explain it away. But the story continues. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished. He got up quickly and spoke and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the middle of the fire? Because they actually threw them down into the fire. And they answered and said, O king, it's true. Three men bound in the middle of the fire. Verse 25 says, and he answered and said, but wait a minute. Hold on. I see four men. Watch this. And they're loose. And they're walking around in the fire. And they have no hurt. Ha, and I like the last one best. And the fourth has, is like the son of God. Oh, you got to get this thing. Everything he was trying to do, he lost in this process. Everything Nebuchadnezzar was trying to do. Number one, he saw four, not three. Number two, they were walking around. The, the binding didn't work. Number three, they were in the midst and they had no hurt. And number four, divinity showed up. Real divinity showed up. So there's, the next three things come quick. Number four is presence. When you're going through persecution, when you're going through the trials of your life, understand the fourth P is presence. The presence of God will be with you. Hebrews 13.5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Ha, it is his presence that makes the next two things possible. And I want you to get this. If Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had taken, taken opportunity to avoid the fire, they would have also avoided meeting Christ. Did you get that? The pre-incarnate Christ shows up in the fire because they're not afraid to go into the fire. Sometimes it takes the fire for us to have the right experience with Christ. It's in the middle of your trial that you meet him, that you get a chance to walk around with him, that you get some alone quality time with him. I experienced that myself as I was going through some of the things I went through, the loneliness that it created. The only one who could fill the void was Jesus Christ. There are times that I stay up all night agonizing with him as I was going through things and, and everything had been ripped from me and I was in tears agonizing with God, asking him why. But it was during that time that I would feel him come near. Presence. Presence leads to number five. Purification. That the trial of your faith, 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You've got to go through something to be pure. Watch this. Some of us are bound, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were uh, symbolically, they were bound, literally, we are bound symbolically by our sins, by our past, by our weaknesses, by our addictions, and it is the fire where God burns the binding off of you. 
It's in the fire that he purifies you. It's in the fire that the things that you trifled with, that you couldn't let go, that, that you struggled with, it takes the heat of the furnace, of the fire, for you to finally be able to lean wholly on God and allow the fire of your trial to burn away your weaknesses. Purification happens sometimes in the fire. But the sixth one, the sixth one is this one, protection. When you're going through your trials, the sixth P is that you must understand that God is a protecting God. He will not give you more than you can bear. He will not allow you. Man, sometimes I was going through stuff and I said, Lord, I've heard that my whole life. That you won't give more than I can bear, but I'm not sure, Lord. If there was a meter on this thing, I think it's busted because um, I'm, I'm out of gas here, Lord. But he says in Psalms 91, 6 and 7, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday, a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come near you. 27, and the princes, the governors, the captains, the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor, nor was one here of their head singed. I like this, neither was their, were their coats changed, watch this, nor the smell of fire passed on them. Ooh, the fire that killed the mighty men from a distance couldn't even leave a scent on the men of God. What are we afraid of? Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servants and that trusted in him and have changed the king's word. He thought he was divine. He thought his word was divine word. When he saw God in action, he said, No, he done, he's changed my word. And yielded their bodies that they may not serve nor worship any god except their own god. How did they make this point? Now you got to understand what God is doing. God is using Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar thought he won in Judah. He thought he won when he took them captive. He didn't realize that God was setting him up. And God does that. He, it may look like God lost the battle, but God's going to win the war. And so when he gets him there, what he does is he, he gets him there, and what he does is he shows him my, his power. But he doesn't just show Nebuchadnezzar. I want you to get this. The entire kingdom understands how powerful God is. And of all of the pagan leaders in all of the Bible, only Nebuchadnezzar, well, one of the few that you could really say was converted is this king. How did it happen? Because three boys and Daniel, three boys, were willing to sacrifice themselves. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servant and, and trusted him, in him. Changed the king's word. They yielded their bodies that they might, might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Verse 29, therefore I make a decree. Here comes the seventh P. That every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their house, houses shall be made a dunghill because there is, ha, I like this, there's no other god that can deliver after this sort. Remember what he said at first? Who is that God? He, now he answers his own question. Oh, I love the way God does it. He answers his own question. There is no other God that can set, deliver after this sort. Then the king, watch the last P, he promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The seventh P when you're going through your persecution, when you're going through your trial, is understand that God, when it is all said and done, he will vindicate you. He will promote you. Whoso despises the word shall be destroyed, but he that fears the commandments shall be rewarded. Even the, even the, 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 uh, the martyrs as they burned uh, on stakes in the world, old world, as they burned uh, at stakes would sing hymns, they were promoted. And some would wonder how could they continue to sing the songs of Zion as they burned. Stephen was promoted at his death because he was able to look up and see Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. I don't mean a prosperity promotion here on earth, even though it might mean that. I, I mean God is going to put you in a place and, and elevate you to a place you never thought you'd get to. 
Couple quick quotes and we're done. Special messages. Troublous times are before us. In many instances, friends will become alienated. Without cause, men will become our enemies. The motives of the people of God will be misinterpreted, not only by the world, but by their own brethren. The Lord's servants will be put in hard places. A mountain will be made of a molehill to justify men in pursuing a selfish, unrighteous course. The work that men have done faithfully will be disparaged and underrated because apparent prosperity does not attend their efforts. Some of us are going to go through these things. When the religion of Christ is, held in most, is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. Last one, by misrepresentation. These men will be clothed in dark vestments of dishonesty, because circumstances beyond their control made their work perplexing. They will be pointed to as men that cannot be trusted. And this will be done by members of the church. God's servants must arm themselves with the mind of Christ. They must not expect to escape insult and misjudgment. They will be called enthusiasts and fanatics. But let them not become discouraged. God's hands are on the wheel of his providence guiding his work to the glory of his name. Amen. I'm out of time. But I'm going to make a very brief appeal to the Watch and Pray congregation. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, as this music is playing, I ask you to think about what these three Hebrew boys went through. I want you to think about what our prophet says we are going to face. I want you to ask God right now to not just begin the process of getting you ready, that God would make us ready. That we wouldn't be getting ready, that we would be ready. Time is too short now. The signs are all around us. I had a pastor when I was young who used to preach and he, he would say, even for those Adventists who've left the church and no longer want to read Revelation or Daniel or the prophecies or the spirit of prophecy, he said they will read it on the cover of magazines, on the cover of newspapers. I would say they will now read it on the internet feeds on their phones. The prophecies are being fulfilled. We know that. But I want to encourage you in his promises. I don't want you to just know that things are going to get hard. I want you to know like the three Hebrew boys knew. Things are going to get hard, but he is able. As David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. You want to be ready to stand in these last days. Stand where you are. We'll pray and close out this session. Father God, as we stand, we stand understanding that even our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's none righteous, Lord. No, not one. Like Isaiah said, Lord, we are a people of unclean lips. But today, Lord, we stand on your promises. As those three Hebrew boys knew those promises, and they fell into a burning, fiery furnace, unafraid because of those promises. Father God, facing fire again in these last days. 
some of the house of Judah are not going to stand. Some of the house of Judah are going to come up with sophisticated rationales as to why they should bow. But Lord, we ask that in this room, under the sound of my voice, those who might hear this sermon later, that we would be convinced today to stand when the time comes. That we would not stand because we're afraid of what might happen to us. We stand because we love a God who is able. And that love has cast out all fear. We ask a blessing on the Sabbath, Lord, this Sabbath. On the outreach that is to be done. That there would be appointments, Lord, that someone would get a tract in their hand that, that needs it. And Father God, the work that is being done at this church would continue with power. Father God, no limitation would ever be put on what this church can do. That they would know that the storehouses of heaven would be poured out upon this place. And Father God, the work in this corner of the vineyard might be finished. It's our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen. And amen. amen.